morning, everyone. It's great to talk to you. Um, all, as always, uh, you know, I support the rare disease community. I'm really glad uh, that, that you're gathering together and that you're going to work on uh, an advocacy for the patients. It's really important. So I was asked to talk about a couple things, um, particularly the CEDAR reorganization and its um, impact on rare diseases. Actually, I was just talking to Frank Sasanowski, uh, the second, about this, uh, what he's uh, proposed, and uh, which is uh, well covered in the press this morning, and um, you know, um, my thoughts on that. So, this, what is the uh, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research? Um, what is its reorganization? What it, uh, place do rare diseases play? Well, first of all, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research basically that I had, um, you know, regulates the drugs. We don't regulate some of the uh, biologics therapies, such as the gene therapies, vaccines, cellular therapies. They're regulated by the Center for Biologics. But we regulate all the different kinds of drugs. So, And we currently approve a very large um, percentage of our approvals of new entities every year, new to the market, are uh, for rare diseases now. And that's been kind of a sea change, and that's very good, okay, because, um, you know, we're chipping away at those rare diseases, although I know there are at least 7,000, and we've only made a small dent so far, but we'll, we'll keep, uh, I think the community will keep working on that. Now, as far as changing uh, Center for Drugs, uh, different parts of CEDAR have reorganized over time. And um, in the early 2000s, we reorganized our safety program. Uh, over the last 10 years, we've been working on our quality program. The quality program is to make sure that the drugs, when they are delivered, they actually deliver the performance they're supposed to deliver. In other words, they're not, don't have impurities in them, they're not contaminated, they are potent as they're supposed to be, and so forth. So we've been, has, have reorganized that program, and that's working very well. Uh, about six years ago, we had to reorganize the generic drugs program because we got user fees, and that uh, required us to hire about a thousand people, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and that last year we approved a thousand generic drugs, for example, and so that's very important as far as improving affordability of drugs for the public. Uh, we have a biosimilars program that's growing, and that uh, is requiring reorganizations and so forth. So all programs need to change as the times change and the science changes. And currently, we're in the process of proposing what we call a modernization of the new drugs regulatory program. And that program goes beyond the Office of New Drugs. It includes um, the Office of Translational Sciences that has our statisticians and our um, clinical pharmacologists in it, our Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, which has already been kind of reorganized, so they're not going to be too much more reorganized in this effort our safety office, Office of uh, Surveillance and Epidemiology, and so forth. And, um, <clears throat> but there's a lot of emphasis on the Office of New Drugs, since that's the one that really hasn't changed very much in a pretty long time, maybe 18 years or so, uh, significantly. Um, and the modernization has much more, and I will try to explain that to you, than reorganization. People often focus on reorgs, okay? But you can just move the boxes around, really, and nothing changes at all. We're seeking to do some fundamental um, reimagining uh, and uh, repurposing how we do new drug evaluation. And the reorganization is in service of that, not the other way around. So um, we um, have worked through this with the staff over the past 18 months, and we've presented a proposal to our staff. However, this is just a proposal, and it has to go through huge uh, numbers of uh, review and concurrence in the federal government, all the way up to Congress. They have to have a chance to look at it and make sure they concur with it. So we're a long way, all right, so don't, you know, <laughs> hold your breath. <laughs> we're a long way from putting the reorganization part of this modernization into effect. But we have 
work through with the staff how the reorg part will look, how people will move, and so forth. And so I'm going to talk to you about that proposal, but keep in mind it's only a proposal and there are many bodies that get to look at it and have input and yay or nay and so forth. Um, so um, what, are, what are some of the things we're doing? Well, first of all, we're going to centralize our project management. Um, and that might seem like a no-brainer to the people who have, you know. But when I came to Cedar the first time in 1994, I, I and a couple other people were, were the ones who made uh, the new drug office get project management. And they were very resistant to that. They said, nobody's going to tell us, like, when to get things done. <laughs> but, of course, now you can't rip the project managers out of their hands. They love project management. They realize it's really the key to getting everything done. So uh, many years later, um, but we would we are going to put those folks together into a central operations unit. And what will this do? This will provide process consistency across the Office of New Drugs and all the participants in those processes, which are the IND process and the um, review of marketing application process. And so those processes will start to look much, much more uniform over time. And they are already starting to have more convergence right now. Um, the next one is we have formed in the office, or are proposing to form, although we've kind of formed it informally, the Office of New Drugs Policy for policy consistency. And I know this is a big issue, okay, for the community. What are the policies and can they, are they consistent from one division or one review group to another? And the policy office has already started working. They've been, um, it's virtual office that we formed uh, under Keith Flanagan has been uh, working for about six months. Uh, some of you who pay attention to these things have noticed, most of you wouldn't have noticed, but we've put out an um, extremely large number of uh, draft guidances and, and guidances over the past six months, and we would expect that pace to continue now. So the goal is to get written um, guidance out on our thoughts uh, in, you know, in a timely manner, and then people can object to that or appeal about that, but at least they know what we're thinking. And if you want to come in for a meeting or something, you'll have some substrate to work on as far as what we think in that particular area. And that uh, policy office is helping with that, but they're also helping with a wide range of other issues around policy consistency in the new drug side. And then we've put together a regulatory science group. This is very important. Obviously, it's important for rare diseases. Um, this contains, among other things, there a qualification process for biomarkers, patient reported outcomes, clinical outcome assessments that are new. We call it a qualification process, which means acceptance for regulatory use. We would had an informal process in place for many years. And the Cures Act formalized that and put time frames on it and new requirements. And so we have an, uh, in our regulatory science group, which again we formed informally right now, um, we have those functions and we've implemented the new procedures under Cures. So say for a rare disease, this is very common, you know, the um, manifestations of that disease are not like other diseases. And so you have to get new endpoints, right? Uh, that you would use in the trial. And you need, and it's really useful to have a way to study those and get the regulators to uh, sign off on them in advance and agree with them, okay, before you embark upon a development program, uh, in fact, as early as possible. So we're working with a lot of disease groups on developing endpoints and they're going through this qualification process, for example. So, um, Biomarker surrogate endpoints is another one that we agreed to have a um, oversight group uh, on new surrogate endpoints. So we'd have management oversight across the office and that's in place. I sit on that group. And uh, so if um, a group proposes a new surrogate endpoint, which again is very common in a rare disease, right, because it's, everything is new, um, then that group would work with the division and help and provide uniform policy consistency on how we treat proposals for surrogate endpoints. And again, patient reported outcomes or other outcome measures. Um, a lot of people, of course, are very interested, for example, in using wearables 
uh, and other uh, types of digital stuff <laughs> of different kinds to record what actually happens to patients and, and so forth. And we're working on policies on that and also uh, those are the kind of uh, outcome measures that, that are, it's very useful to have to work through the process on. Um, in addition, um, O&D has never had a really strong research uh, oversight uh, component or that uh, this year we funded a lot of research that the uh, scientists in O&D wanted to do. And, uh, but we need to formalize that process and, and provide them help, getting the research uh, assistance they need, getting um, other things they need. And so we're setting that type of uh, process up in the office. And we've gotten a, a very enthusiastic response <laughs> from the uh, scientists and physicians in O&D who want to do research. Typically, that research would be, what have we done in the past? What has worked? What hasn't worked? How can we propose something better for the future for drug assessment that will work better? So that's typically what they want to research on. And then informatics, there's a huge thirst for a better informatics support for knowledge management. We put a proposal before Congress, a budgetary proposal for knowledge management. Um, again, I know some of the impetus, say, between um, um, behind the um, Rare Disease Center of Excellence proposal is the feeling we don't have policy consistency across O&D. Part of that is they don't have insight and knowledge and visibility into what the other groups are doing because our knowledge management is really pretty non-existent. And um, we plan to, whether we get funding or not, we plan to start implementing against knowledge management next year. We're developing a plan right now. So, and then the reorg, okay, that's what people are always inter interested in, but it's only a part of it. What we're going to do is we're going to try to flatten the organization. What does that mean? Well, you can have an organization that's kind of tall and narrow, and right, and so you have a lot of diseases, different disparate diseases lumped together in one group, right? We're going to try and flatten it so that subspecialists can lead divisions, and everything in that division is something under their subspecialty. That's probably the best way to put it. Um, and then we're going to try to uh, group those divisions into sort of um, logical groupings, such as neuroscience, right? such as immunology and inflammation, such as antimicrobials. The Oncology Center of Excellence, what they did is they grouped uh, everything under oncology, right? That makes sense, right? However, actually, that isn't what is do was done. <laughs> and so there is benign hematology, including a lot of rare diseases within oncology right now. We're going to pull that, we're proposing to pull that out, okay? And because if you have sickle cell disease or whatever, you don't have cancer. You have a very serious disease. You don't have cancer, though. You don't belong in the oncology uh, office really, and there are many diseases, many hematologic diseases, as you're well aware, that are like that. So um, we're, we're flattening the organization. There's going to be a disease focus in the divisions, and what I've asked, we're providing, uh, we're proposing to provide a lot more support, um, and we're asking the clinicians to sort of turn outward, right, and focus on drug development in their specialty area and interactions with the scientific and the patient community and um, understanding the gaps and the unmet needs in that community and really being advocates for drug development in their area uh, and, and working with the community on um, development pathways. But of course, we're, this doesn't mean we're going to lower our standards. We have the same standards, but really uh, assist um, and feel their responsibility is to promote on behalf of patients promote drug development in their specialty area. And I think everybody understands that ask, and some are more comfortable with that than others, right? But that's really what we're requesting. And in, in, uh, re, in uh, sort of to compensate for that or allow them to do that, we're going to provide them with more support, including we're working on a whole new process for review, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is more structured and has more data analysts and other support people. So we're not ask, we're ask, we're going to try to ask the clinicians to do what they're trained to do, which is to think about the disease conditions and their uh, the medical need and so forth. And we're going to get other uh, specialists to help with some of the things that um, 
those specialists are better trained in. Now, you'll be interested and you probably know that there's going to be a rare uh, disease division, there is a rare disease division proposed as part of this. Now, it won't include all the rare diseases, but we would um, imagine, and I'll talk about the multidisciplinary view, review in a minute, that it would participate in assessment of all the rare diseases. But um, the uh, medical genetics, or what we call inborn errors uh, group, would be part of this and some other rare diseases, plus uh, our current rare disease staff, so they would be in a review division. So other important parts of the modernization, it looks to me, reading your body language out there, you're with me so far. You understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> Good. <laughs> because most people aren't that interested in all the boxes. I'm not showing you any boxes, and that's why, really, because the boxes, I think, are distracting. Um, we're going to, so other sort of more important parts, almost, of this that the um, reorg will uh, enable, we're going to improve improve and standardize the safety review process for the pre-market review program. And we're going to standardize that to a great extent. Right now, we get standardized data sets from all the companies, but we have variable uh, ways of approaching that. And we have a lot of data scientists. We're going to get them to approach this in a standardized way. And I won't get more technical on this, but and we're going to move that way up front, like a couple months after submission, which is around the filing date so that you have, we have done all that analysis, we can look at all that information. We're gonna try and move much of the review process much earlier to give the rest of the time to work out with the applicant what the problems that have been you know, uncovered in the review. And generally, we'll improve the market application review process. We're gonna do the same thing with the efficacy review and all the other reviews. And then we're going to modernize our documentation. Have any of you ever tried to look at something we submit to an, a medical review, we've submitted to an advisory committee, or in, have any of you ever looked at that or uh, is on the web? Not very many. I can tell you hardly anybody does. <laughs> and because we looked, we did a survey, and they're very long, and they're very detailed, and they're very hard to follow. So we are having a group that is working on, and they're very excited. Um, a single multidisciplinary view of the entire application, except the quality parts, which is a separate issue. Okay, but the, um, the toxicology, clinical pharmacology, the statistics, the clinical data, right, in a single review, um, it's maybe 30 pages in length. We think, and it will be issue based. What problems did we find, uh, and what are the, how are these problems being addressed? or evaluated. So we're going to be piloting that. We're going to do a tabletop exercise first on an existing review that's been completed and see how well this works. But there's a great deal of enthusiasm. So um, I think that in um, conjunction with go having data analysts go through in a much more uh, rigorous and standardized way ag against the uh, data sets will really move things uh, faster. Um, and, but more thorough, actually, and uh, more, more uniform. So as I said, we're going to modernize the guidance development process. We already started on that. That's why you see all these guidances coming out. Um, modernize adverse event reporting from clinical trials. This is um, terrible right now, kind of. Uh, right now, when, uh, if you're in a clinical trial and you experience an adverse event, the company has to send it to various, uh, they have to write it up and then send it to various places in Europe, right, and other regulators, depending on where the IND is. Then they have to uh, fill out a form for FDA, and then they have to make a PDF of the form, then they have to write a letter to us, and then they have to submit it to us, and then we take that and we have it in paper form. And uh, the Oncology Center of Excellence, I know Amy's here somewhere, they, they are getting thousands of thousands and thousands of these, like every month. And they had too many um, to, to handle. And so we thought, well, this form that they have to fill out is the same form they, we fill out for uh, adverse event report. And we have a database for that. So OCE piloted um, just sending the data, the form in a data format and f um, submitting it to our uh, FAIRS database. And that worked perfectly. 
So we are going to transfer this activity to an electronic submission of a form, um, and we're well on the way to getting that done. That's being uh, financed by CEDAR and led out of the Oncology Center of Excellence, but we'll do it for all the drugs because it's such a great idea. So we'll modernize that. That means we can apply, immediately apply the statistical tools that are available and graphical tools that are available in FAIRS to the IND uh, reports. And eventually then we can make a seamless link between what was found pre-market and then what was reported once the drug was on the market. Um, uh, Automation, we're still ongoing on that to try and again provide the in, uh, IT infrastructure. Uh, we are early in the IND process review and figuring out how we can streamline that and make that more effective and efficient and also gather the knowledge from the IND and so forth. So that's what we're doing. I don't know how much time I have and should I stop? Two minutes, we'll take some questions. Okay, fine. So I wanted to give some thoughts on the um, Rare Disease Center of Excellence, <laughs> if I may. Um, you know, medical uh, product regulation is complicated in many aspects, and everybody focuses on the clinical part, because that's kind of the sexy part, and it's part of the expensive part, and that's when you know about everything. But really, the quality and um, it's all sorts of evaluations go into medical product regulation. And you have to admit, like, I do have some understanding about rare diseases and their challenges. I really do. I, I do sympathize. And it's not like I'm just coming in here and saying, eh. But, um, um, you know, rare diseases actually need a more multidisciplinary approach to their assessment. And they, we need to use more of a totality of evidence approach, right? Because there just aren't enough patients to do these large trials and all this stuff. So we have to look as, you know, what, is, what do we know about the pathophysiology of the rare disease? What do we know about the drug as far as mechanistically? What do we know about it? And then put that together with what did we find in animals, if there were animals, and then animal studies, and what did we find in the clinic? kind of put that all together and then we can decide do we have substantial evidence or whatever. So um, we get that and that's where this multidisciplinary review will be writing. The 30 page document I think will come in very handy. It'll force all the disciplines to work together and talk about what evidence do we have from all lines of inquiry about this drug. Um, so, um, but we, uh, I understand the desire for a, um, a strong advocacy for rare diseases within the agency. I understand the concern that you're reinventing the wheel perhaps when you go to a division that doesn't have a lot of rare disease experience and all of a sudden um, you have to explain all this all over again or re, uh, you know, go through it again. However, for any given rare disease, if you have a rare disease staff, they're not going to be experts in that disease area. In other words, they, they're probably not going to be nephrologists or endocrinologists or whatever is needed, pediatricians. And often there are only a few experts in the world and they're outside people, but you might have, it might be pediatricians, nephrologists, rare disease specialists who need to work together. So, you do need the clinical subspecialists as well as people who are experts in small clinical trials or evaluation programs where you can only look at a few people. And this speaks to having a matrix structure. A matrix structure is where people are in clusters of expertise and then you draw in that structure to, um, to put together a team for any given uh, activity you want to do, right? And many of you, if you work in some kind of industries, most industries are uh, managed this way. So I'd advise against advocating for something very rigid in an oncology center of excellence unless, uh, I'm sorry if this, sorry, uh, if, uh, unless really, you, you know, you're totally committed to that. I think that would actually be negative to the cause of rare diseases to try to have a, single center of excellence. And I believe my own opinion is that having things reporting in the commissioner's office, advocates typically, 
want things to report to the administrator, the commissioner, whatever, the head of NIH. They want their, because they think that'll give their program more visibility. Actually, what it gives is their program less oversight and attention because these uh, agency heads are very busy. They're political appointees. They're not managers. And so we see this over and over again, advocates for different things. They put it, it has to report to this person. And so they get a little cloud of staffs around them that actually don't have a lot of attention and management. <laughs> so, and annoy the programs quite a bit. So <laughs> that isn't the dynamic you want to have in a rare disease space, I think. So hopefully we can talk about that more. So that's what I have. I think the uh, OND reorg and the modernization of the new drug regulatory program will really be very positive for rare diseases. I think what we did on cures and that what Congress did on cures was very positive for rare diseases. I think the future is bright here, and um, um, I, I think that we ought to have more conversation about any uh, center of excellence. Thank you. <laughs>